we're going to start in when we hit 50 people. We had about 100 people register for this evening. And uh, when we hit about 50 people, we will start the meeting. And uh, uh, all kinds of people uh, are responding to us because this is actually an initiative on the part of Aliran, which is based in Penang, Malaysia. And it is because some of us have got very close ties with people in Myanmar. Uh, traditionally, of course, you know, people would come down from Yangon down to Malamian to Penang, you know, by boat. And so, you know, this was the connection that we used to have. But now we are also very concerned about each other's human rights violations and so on and so forth. So this is a... Um, so we posted this meeting and all kinds of other people who were concerned about uh, Myanmar began to uh, respond and they're very keen. And there are some people from the uh, from ARENA, this Asian Regional Exchange for New Alternatives, uh, a group of progressive intellectuals, teachers, journalists from the East Asian region. Uh, but we also have people, uh, we also posted this onto the World Social Forum you know, website and, uh, and some of them are also tagging along with us. So, um, so all kinds of people. And then, of course, uh, we're very happy that quite a few Myanmar people have been able also to join us. Um, shall we start? Boleh lah. Um, yeah, we are at 49. We can start, actually. Okay. Yeah, I'm we're getting... 50 now. All right. Maybe we can start lah. Okay, um, I think we will start because we want to try to finish this program in one and a half hours. And uh, uh, what is so nice about this evening is that uh, uh, I just want to start by saying maybe um, we've been uh, told that actually up to now more than 50 people have been killed. You know, um, and uh, we want to start the evening by just remembering all these people who have given their lives to the struggle. Uh, um, and we'll just keep ourselves quiet for one minute, okay, beginning from now. So in remembrance of the people who have been killed in this very, very short period since um, February the 1st. Okay, thank you very much, friends. Now, just a very short, brief mention about Aliran. We are a multi-ethnic, multi-religious organization based in Penang, Malaysia. And uh, we advocate for justice, freedom, and solidarity. We comment, well, a bit like a people's think tank. We comment critically on social issues. We do social analysis and alternative ideas, uh, keeping in mind the national and the global picture. And uh, we have always struggled in support of human rights uh, based on also universal spiritual values. And we are also listed on the roster of the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations. And we have been around since 1977. And uh, like I said, we are based in Penang. All right, that's uh, without much further ado. Um, I'm Francis Lowe. Uh, I'll be the moderator for this evening. Um, I am. I used to be the president of Aliran. Now I'm active as an exco member. But uh, equally important, I suppose, is I've been um, since I retired from the university in, uh, in University Science Malaysia. I have been actually traveling uh, to and fro Myanmar on several uh, for the past ten years and. Uh, doing some kind of consultancy where I advocate for development, democratization, decentralization. So um, what that's, okay, with that now done, let us then uh, focus on what we are going to do this evening. Maybe to get into uh, the mood of things, let me just show you some pictures, you know, of uh, uh, that we've prepared for you uh, of some of the demonstrations. Dila? 
Next slide. Next one. So this is very early days. Mendeley uh, demonstration began, began in Mendeley. And these are people all holding up these leaves, uh, which think five peace and glory. So people are seated on the floor in Mendeley. Next slide. Yep. And then Yangon also began to began to have its demonstrations. These are a group of nuns, you know, who are lying on the floor praying, you know, uh, and uh, friends, you know, uh, beginning to hold posters and so on and so forth. Free door, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi. Next slide. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of right people seated around. So the vendors went around, you know, distributing free food to people. And there were people who did, you know, stop skits and these protesters condemn the brutality of Tatmadaw. Down on the floor, there are bones, you know, of, uh, uh, and blood, you know, to signify the brutality of the regime. Next slide. And this is then, you know, um, the important 2-2-2-2-0-2-1, five twos. So this is a country where numerology is extremely important, you know, soothsayers are very important. And on this occasion, there were five twos and it, it sort of kick-started the uprising. And they refer this to as now the 5-2 uprising, 22nd February 2021. And this is in downtown Yangon. Sule is uh, uh, next door to the Sule Shangri-La. So this is, of course, the Shangri-La is shut down. Uh, everybody took over the place. Next slide. Uh, this is also in another area of uh, Yangon where a lot of people were also gathering for demonstrations and all this. This is uh, uh, in Ledan, which is outside of the University of Yangon area. Uh, huge crowds as well. Uh, these places have now become, both these places have become out of bounds because they've put up barricades, put up barricades to prevent people from gathering in these very popular gathering uh, sites. Next slide. And this was then uh, in Nepito. Nepito is the new capital. Uh, it's out in the boondocks. And, but nonetheless, you know, a lot of people went to demonstrate in uh, Pimana and Nepito. This is where the old town meets the new town. Nepito is this huge capital city. I mean, they have got 10-lane ten highways, uh, but hardly any traffic on these. A huge international airport, but very, very few planes land in Nepito. Next slide. And this in Mandalay then um, on the same occasion. Uh, so this was, it took place in all over different, different uh, cities. So next slide. Makeshift medical aid for the demonstrators. Uh, this was a sort of an ambulance, you know, people just cutting away somebody who was wounded. And then they tried to stitch up somebody who had a big gash on the head. You know, uh, this was in actually one of the police vans. But the police told, no, 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 I've got no time. I cannot wait for you. So they, you know, she couldn't finish the job. Next slide. Okay, this is the timeline very briefly about what's happened, you know, since. Uh, first of February, of course, the Tamado then launches the coup. Aung San Suu Kyi, President Win Min, plus other leaders arrested. The protests begin in Mandalay. Among the doctors, the protest spreads to various other towns. Um, an emergence then of something called the Civil Disobedience Movement, CDM. The committee representing the Pidong Su Luto, CRPH, and the General Strike Committees, you know, GSC. So we will have some friend who will try to uh, discuss this with us afterwards. Uh, then the five twos uprising began 22nd February. More than a million people throughout the country were involved. And the important, uh, very significant then on the 26th of uh, February, the Myanmar ambassador to UN denounces the coup. He, you know, he uses the occasion when he was presenting in the United Nations to actually call upon the world to take all necessary help to help Myanmar regain its democracy. And the CRPH then appoints an envoy to UN and sets up an international liaison office in Maryland. Uh, 22nd, 28th, uh, 18 people were killed. 
the police got increasingly vicious, began to use tear gas, water cannons, live bullets, and charge into demonstrators. And can you go up a bit, Dila? Uh, well, I wanted to say that the next line you can't see is actually uh, uh, yesterday, which is actually the 3rd of March. It was the bloodiest day yet. And on that occasion, uh, 38 people were killed just yesterday. You know, so that was a very, very horrific day. Uh, next slide. Okay, so now we will begin very quickly then to move into the speakers. We've got a whole bunch of friends who, are, who will speak to us. Uh, the first speaker is Ms. Debbie Stoddard. She's the founder and coordinator of ASEAN Burma uh, based in Bangkok. And she's an old campaigner. She's been running this organization which she founded, ASEAN, uh, for the last 15, 16 years or even more. She will clarify that to us. Debbie, go ahead, please. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. And I just want to say especially hello to my old friend, Paul Lim, who I have not seen for a very long time. So happy to see you here, Paul. Um, actually, I set up Altian 25 years ago. 25 years. I'm sorry, Levi. It's a, it's a, I intended to run this organization for two years, but it's like Gilligan, a human rights Gilligan's Island. We, we went... We, I said, I thought I would be here for two years, but I'm still here 25 years later. Anyway, I just want to say it's an honor to be here, especially since I am a long time member of Aliran. And I, I did a lot of advocacy in the early days in the UN, UN Human Rights Commission. In those days, it was a commission uh, uh, in, the in the late 90s. Uh, to advocate for human rights and democracy in Burma, Myanmar. And I was proud to be able to do that as a representative uh, under uh, Aleran's banner, since Aleran has ECOSOC status. So that's a really special thing for me. Um, I, uh, I've been involved in supporting the human rights and democracy movement in Burma, Myanmar since the uprising of 8888. Uh, in fact, uh, if you look at my Facebook friends, I think I have more Facebook friends from Burma than from Malaysia. So, um, and when the country opened up, uh, we, we, we had been giving a lot of workshops in the border areas where members, uh, where participants would come to the border for trainings. And we also have had a women's specific leadership training ongoing continuously since 1997. So we are very proud of the fact that many of the women who were fighting against impunity of the military all these years are women who have been trained by us. And when the country opened, uh, opened up and I was finally removed uh, from the blacklist because I was declared a threat to national security in Burma, Myanmar for 13 years, um, when we were allowed to return, we, we have already um, uh, delivered uh, more than 120 training workshops uh, for gra mainly grassroots communities. And we have done so in 10 out of the 14 states and regions of the country. So, um, uh, it, and so what I wanted to say very clearly is that Firstly, we have to understand that the coup is still in progress. The coup is not complete and can be reversed. And this is very important to understand because the people in Burma, Myanmar, the young people risking their lives in the streets understand that the coup is not complete and they need our solidarity to reverse this coup. The second thing is that this military junta is both illegitimate and illegal, even under its own constitution. The 2008 constitution, which is notorious, uh, was drafted by the military, and yet General Min Aung broke his own constitution. And this is important to understand, and it helps you understand why senior public servants up to the rank of director general have turned their back 
on the junta and join the civil disobedience movement. This is why we saw the UN permanent rep of Myanmar, the Myanmar UN permanent rep, turn his back after years of defending all kinds of human rights abuses, then denounce this military regime and put him, stood on the side of the committee representing the Pidang Soluto, which is the committee representing the national parliament, which is at this point, both legally and legitimately the interim government of the country. And when we say that, we have to understand that the CRPH government has already appointed 10 act, uh, sorry, acting ministers to cover nine portfolios. And in the past 48 hours, the CRPH interim government has actually declared the military junta a terrorist organization as they are legally entitled to do. And they are doing this despite the fact that they are not allowed to meet physically. They are meeting just like us, like we are by Zoom. And they are in hiding, knowing full well that every courageous step they take to lead this country is also putting them at greater danger of being detained and dragged away. So they are all in hiding. So this is important to understand, especially as Malaysians, we, when, we, when, when we hear this nonsense by ASEAN, some of the ASEAN countries saying it's an internal matter, no, this is a coup. It's been recognized by several governments. The, the president of the Bundestag in Germany has already given a letter, sent a letter to the CRPH and, and congratulating and acknowledging their legitimacy. So, you know, that's very, very important. The other thing that's important is that what we're seeing in the streets of Yangon and Mandalay has been happening behind, uh, uh, be in, not in front of us, but has been happening all this time in many of the ethnic areas. Now you're starting to see in Mandalay, all that brutality is committed by Light Infantry Division 33, one of the notorious divisions that committed atrocity crimes against the Rohingya. So, uh, and what they are doing in Mandalay, Yangon, and actually a lot of the ethnic cities and towns who have against civilians peacefully protesting is akin to a violations of the Geneva Convention if this was a situation of conventional warfare. So we have to understand that. The other thing we have to understand is that resistance to this coup has united the country. There have been protests in 307 out of a total of 330 townships in the whole country. And that these protests have not been one-off protests. They have been very, very uh, frequent and in many cases almost daily. And what we are not seeing is that in these smaller places, the local people there are taking a great risk because they are facing disproportionate violence. In the uh, earlier data we found is that considering the size of the crowds in these places, people in the ethnic towns and the smaller uh, townships where there is less media scrutiny are more likely to be arrested, beaten up or killed in, you know, if you think per capita. So this is something that we have to understand. The other thing we have to understand is ASEAN and China. ASEAN keeps finding an excuse not to act by saying, what about China? But then China keeps saying, what about ASEAN? And uh, we, we need to understand that it is neither in ASEAN's interest nor China's interest for this, this instability to continue, especially when there are very serious economic repercussions. The daily internet shutdowns have actually affected the banking industry and businesses. And, um, and that's been made worse by the fact that people uh, have decided that they cannot stay in their offices and cannot stay in their workplaces. They have to go out and protest. So with every act of violence by the, by the authorities, we are seeing greater resistance because people understand if they allow this to pass, 
they are condemning themselves to maybe even 30 years of the same type of regime. Finally, um, we have to recognize that women have been at the leadership of this movement and many of these women took a lot of risks even before the coup because they stood up for the Rohingya, they stood up for justice, they stood up against impunity. And um, it is very inspiring to see that despite being threatened with rape by the police, being um, picked off and it looks like very often women have been targeted with violence by the military and the police, they have bravely stood in the front lines. And finally, Malaysia should be ashamed of itself. Last week, Malaysia deported over a thousand people who technically would have become asylum seekers the moment the coup happened. And some of these it's, people are very worried, there's a great worry that these deportees, Malaysia condemned the coup and then handed over all these people to the Myanmar Navy. And there's a great deal of justified concern because that these people may be forcibly recruited to join groups like Swan Ashin, which are government organized thugs, which are used to kill and uh, beat up um, unarmed protesters who, uh, who stand against the authorities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Debbie. And uh, I'll just, um, Debbie's organization, ASEAN, has just prepared a 15 page update, you know, pulling together all the information that they have gathered together. Uh, if you leave your uh, we will send out that thing. We will, up, uh, we will definitely upload that on the Aliran website, which you can then look at and download. If it's, uh, but if you really want to have your own copy, can you please just email us and we'll make sure that we send you a copy of that. All right. Now, the next speaker Speak. then is... Hello. Okay, the next speaker is Colwyn. Colwyn is 33 years old. He trained as a doctor and then he retrained in the social sciences. He's involved, he's been involved in NGO work for the last almost 10 years. And he will speak on the protest movement coordinated by the CDM, CRPH, and GSE. Now, this, these are, you know, little um, initials that you come across all the time. CDM, Civil Disobedience Movement. So that's, you know, it started off with the doctors all, you know, uh, boycotting work. CRPH. Committee representing the Pidongsu Luto, which means parliament. So these are people who are, this is the new de facto government. They're mainly made up of elected, you know, parliamentarians. And GSE is the general, uh, general strike committees. These are the people who have been directly involved in organizing the demonstrations. So without much further ado, uh, Colwyn, over to you. Thank you so much, Francis. Uh, I just want to show myself uh, and then I will switch off uh, video and I'll keep on without video. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. And I would like to thank uh, Debbie as well uh, for saying that uh, the coup is not complete yet. This is exactly the feeling we have. And this is... Uh, this is why we are trying so hard uh, to make sure that um, this coup could be finally reversed. Um, uh, after that, I will try to explain the movement, uh, what is happening on ground, try to put, put all these into context within the limited time I have. Um, I would like to talk on three things. One is the spontaneity, the decentralized nature of the movement. Uh, the second is the actors in the movement, um, the CDM, CRPH, uh, GSC, GSCN. And I would like to also touch uh, a little bit on recent political development. Uh, timeline wise, I would like to talk about what happened before the coup, the pre-coup, the coup itself, and then the uh, uh, and then like uh, aftermath of the coup because I think uh, this is the only way to understand the nitty gritty of what is actually happening and why this movement is like this. 
Um, even before February 1, the military commander in chief in his speech to uh, in his speech in a military uh, senior level training, he said if the constitution was not followed, then the military must and they could uh, abolish the constitution. So that alarmed the international media. Uh, and also, of course, like domestically as well, people were so worried. And the news media started to report about this possible potential coup. And then the military, uh, the military information team announced a statement saying that military will not commit uh, the coup and they will abide by the 2008 constitution. And then they did the coup on February 1, uh, like, you know, given the, the ridiculous reason of uh, errors in voter list, where international media always say, uh, uh, Hello. Can you hear him? He got cut out. Got cut out. Yep. Lost, yeah. Lost the speaker. It's okay. We can maybe move to. No. Until he come back. Goldwyn. Yeah. Anyway, the, his, uh, the, we, we thought that this would, when we did our test yesterday, also, this was also beginning to happen. Uh, is Go on around? Oh, uh, yes, Francis. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Go on uh, is also trained as a doctor, retrained in social science. He's been working in NGOs. Uh, he, only, he wants to share some insights on the involvement of the youth. Because when you look at all the videos that's coming out from, from uh, Myanmar, you'll be just, I was just so stunned. The people are so young and they've got yet very, very determined. So, you know, Ko Ong will help to explain for us that. And uh, in between, when, if Ko Luin comes back, we will get back to him. Okay. Ko Ong. Uh, thank you, Francis. Uh, I will begin with... Uh, why, why, how, and what the young people are doing in the movement, uh, especially why the young people has been so passionate uh, in uh, resisting, resisting the military coup and resisting the military rule. Because since the, since the very first day of the coup, it feels like uh, our future has been robbed. Uh, we don't want to go back to 80s or 90s. Uh, for, 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 the le for the previous 10 years, like uh, Uta Niu has said, it feels like tomorrow could be better than yesterday. And uh, now with the military back into power, the, the uncertainty for our future is very high with restrictions on personal freedom, restrictions on internet, rule by law rather than rule of law and arbitrary detentions. So we feel like we are fighting for our very existence and we feel like the coup is very personal. Uh, that's why we see so much passion and resistance from the young people every day, despite uh, violent crackdowns from the military. So uh, in my second portion, I, I would like to talk about how the young people has been organizing and coordinating the movement. In the very first day of the coup, young people looked up to their seniors and older people for guidance and what would happen next and what they were supposed to do. But uh, we find that uh, the senior, senior political leadership is gone and the senior intellectuals, uh, almost all of them are silent. And we don't see any old advocates except uh, Ko Min Ko Nai. So naturally, the young people tend to their friends and seniors who are closer to politics and uh, young activists and student unions. And many young students decided to rally around their respective uh, student unions and activists. Uh, the, these students unions became initial rallying points for organizing uh, for the young people and finally the resources. Uh, for instance, uh, many former student union members in Medica University 
they launched the initial civil disobedience movement. And it has been these uh, student unions and young activists that have been organizing all the protests and demonstrations. Uh, we have seen student unions sending letters to Chinese embassy, UN and other international institutions. Uh, so, so the young people, uh, they, are very, they, are, they are also very quick in uh, learning uh, in what happened in previous movement uh, and the movements around the world. I have seen many videos, uh, sometimes subtitled in Burmese, if necessary, on 1988 uprising and the tactics the military Honda used to crack down on the opposition during 1988 to 2010. And uh, it's not just on uh, Facebook, Twitter, the conventional social media, but on also on other social media platforms. I have seen videos and content explaining what the protesters in Hong Kong and Thailand and even Venezuela or Ukraine do and what we can learn from their movements. So this is how the young people have been uh, organizing and, and trying, to, uh, uh, trying to explain to their peers and, and trying to demonstrate what they want. So what exactly uh, is the message from the young people coming out right now? from the movement. Uh, what we are seeing is a more inclusive, uh, a more progressive ideas uh, with regard to the movement and democratization. Uh, we have seen young people holding protester that uh, we are sorry, we apologize uh, all, all the people, including from Kachin to Rohingya. So like uh, these young people, some of these young people, they have been exposed to international community and international training during the, uh, during the opening of Myanmar uh, between 2010 and 2015. So we, from what we are seeing, the, the message from the young people is more inclusive and more progressive in demanding uh, and, and further democratization. But the most challenging for the young people right now is to keep the non-violent discipline because the military had been using so much inhumane violence against the young people. Uh, yesterday, uh, we saw on Facebook uh, that the young people saying that if CRPH were to form an army right now, they are ready to enter the service. So mm -hmm. like the international community need to understand the passion of the young people and you, we have to support, you have to support the young people to derive their passion into building a sustainable, successful, non-violent movement. Uh, just telling them to stick to non-violence when their friends are being inhumanely massacred by the police, but they perceive as terrorists, might soon turn to deaf ears. So we have to understand that uh, the coup has been, the coup and the crackdown has been very traumatizing to the young people. And what the international community could do right now is to show that the war is in fact watching and that they are not alone. Uh, on 28 February, there was a movement called Make Tea Alliance movement in which the, the, the Burmese activists call out to their friends in Hong Kong, Taiwan, Thailand to start showing solidarity. And there was a demonstration in Thailand on 28 February. So we also see like the solidarity from uh, Xi'an Malaysian politician like uh, Sai Sadiq and Hong Kong politician like Nathan Law. So these kind of gestures might seem unimportant, but like these are very important to the young people because the whole, the whole situation had, has, has, has been very traumatizing for the young people. So like you, you can show the support to the young people. It doesn't necessarily have to be on streets. Uh, you can take a photo or a video or create ads to communicate to the young people of Obama that they are not alone in this fight. And uh, I want to end with a very popular phrase that captures the mood of the young people right now. Uh, it goes like this, uh, which means that the young people, uh, either we get our troop back or we are determined to fight till the very end. So this is the mood of the young people right now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ko Ong. Um, we have Luin here. Luin is back. Okay, Luin. Ko Luin. Can you cut it now, Colin? <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Shall I continue? Yes, please. Okay, so uh, the previous speaker has talked about the youth, and I would like to connect to that uh, in a in a minute. So uh, to go back to what I I said, so the military commander in chief uh, did the coup on February one, but in his own universe, he said, "This is not a coup. This is a constitutional declaration of state of emergency." So this is the lie that he he had created and he is still using it. And so even like he, the, 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 the Hunter's uh, Ministry of Information issued an announcement saying every media in the country which use the term the coup must not use the term coup, but instead use holding or power. And if they do not abide by this, then their publisher license will be revoked. So. So I would like to start with this because I would like to expose to you how, you know, wretched and twisted uh, the nature of the politics by the military right now is. And, and I mean, like uh, uh, the usual suspect, uh, the NLD, the leadership was totally unprepared as well. So now we are seeing the new leadership. And we are hoping for the new outcomes, not like the 1990 election results and the and the subsequent uh, situations in Myanmar. So he staged the coup, and then all the top top leaders were taken away, and the whole leadership. There was a huge leadership vacuum. There was nothing, nothing at all, no clear instruction at all to deal with this coup. Only. One or uh, I think only after uh, 24 hours, there came out a letter by signed by Winting, which said uh, Dong San Suu Kyi left the message to defy in whatever way possible against the military coup. And that time, um, I I just would like to put you into perspective because uh, this is important. That time, all the elected MPs were ready staying in the guest house in Nipidor, ready to convene the, 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 very, the very first day of the third term uh, of the parliament. And they had to wait for three days. They had to wait for three days for NLD senior leadership, you know, whoever was left and arrested to agree to convene the parliament. And so after three days of the leadership vacuum, uh, as, uh, as the previous speaker said, w when the young people were asking their seniors, you know, people who they look up to, people who think uh, um, uh, closer to politics, uh, what to do, how to respond to this coup, uh, the MPs in the CPN guest house in Nipidor could not convince the NLD leadership to convene the parliament. So that was uh, for three days. That was complete total silence and no one was out on streets because people were all waiting for the leadership. That leadership uh, vacuum was filled by Hu Wintain, a senior aide of, a former senior aide of the lady uh, with this uh, letter that she left a message to defy. And in a video interview, Wintain talked about civil disobedience which means uh, non-cooperation, which means uh, uh, social punishment by the general public to the military and security forces and their families, which, which is very much based on the principle of non-violence uh, laid out by Mahatma Gandhi and others. So, so that time, medical doctors in Myanmar were so very exhausted due to the COVID-19 uh, situation but they had this hope because uh, just right before the coup, uh, the first batches of vaccine uh, for COVID-19 were arriving to Myanmar from India. And so they were kind of like, you know, hopeful that they will soon be relieved from this burden of COVID-19 and then, you know, resume the, the normal routine of their medical work. But this coup happened. So the medical doctors, young medical doctors, translated Wintain, Wintain's message and they started the boycott not to go to government's work. So, and also they campaigned around not going to, uh, 
not going to work uh, not only by civil servants, but also by uh, people from banking sector, both private and public. So this is how the civil disobedience movement started. And uh, after three or four days of the coup, Minko Nai, the veteran student leader of the 88 movement, uh, came out uh, in a video message uh, to keep on, to continue to broaden the, the scope of the civil disobedience movement. And that is how the whole nation went into a general strike, uh, starting from that message in the first week. Of course, like, you know, we had uh, the, uh, the people, the people didn't uh, right away start this civil disobedience movement, but, you know, they slowly and slowly joined the movement. Right now, the country is like, uh, is not properly functioning at all. Uh, more than 50% of the staff, as much as like, you know, I, uh, I know uh, are on strike and they have joined the civil disobedience movement. Related to civil disobedience movement is the social punishment where people campaigned uh, around uh, not buying military related uh, products and not you know, uh, uh, associating with military related uh, businesses. That is the civil disobedience movement. So uh, back to the situation of the MPs in Nepiro. Only after three days of convincing the NLD senior leadership, the young MPs in NLD, they convened the parliament with like 70 MPs who did not leave Nebiro right away. And later on, the senior leadership also joined this uh, uh, parliament session. And that is how the CRPH was formed. So basically right now, the CRPH leadership was, is also very young. This is not the usual CEC, you know, we have uh, this like central executive committee, not CEC members of the NLD. And till now, up until now, NLD CEC has not issued a statement that they are uh, supportive of uh, CRPH. So I, I just want to mention you this as well. The CRPH uh, leadership is also very young. This is the new leadership. This is not the usual OCC people. And, uh, and, and even CRPH was formed only on February 8th, but uh, people were already out on the streets protesting uh, since the 4th of uh, February. This was started by a group of uh, young medical doctors in Mandalay, uh, led by uh, Teza San, uh, who is a, a classmate of mine. And the protest was very traditional in Mandalay, but looking at that, the young people, which the previous speaker mentioned, they got the idea to go out and protest. So the protests uh, in Mandalay happened in the morning. Young people, the what we call the Gen Z, the Generation Z, came out in Yangon in the evenings and they started this three finger salute, which they copied from Thailand, which in turn copied from the movie uh, The Hunger Games. And 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 the protest, uh, the protesters used various. Uh, uh, tactics and uh, and ways to uh, to protest. They are very creative. I don't have time to cover on that. So yeah, you I don't just, have time. You don't have time. Yeah, I will quickly uh, talk about the GSC. So the GSC is very young crowd, very young people, mostly from uh, the student uh, uh, unions. Who uh, the name of uh, their organization is the Obama Federation of Student Unions. So these very young leaders are one of those who came out on streets in the very early days and they needed, uh, they, they felt the, the, the need of a political leadership. And that is why they started organizing this general strike committee. Uh, and uh, right now, so the political leadership is uh, Minko Nai, the veteran student leader, uh, the CRPH, which is very young, a new leadership, and GSC, which is more student uh, based, student union based. And the movement is happening as the previous speaker mentioned in a very decentralized, uh, in a way, you know, organized only on social media platforms. Uh, thank you so much. I think uh, 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 for, for, for now, this is enough. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Colwyn. Okay, let's uh, continue to move on. The next speaker then is Mathu. Mathu is our first woman. Uh, she's a local uh, uh, Burmese 
woman and uh, she studied in the University of Mandalay. She worked in Yangon, but right now she's currently based in Mandalay. So she's been observing quite a different perspective about what's happening in Mandalay. And uh, she will also try to um, talk about the role of young women in particular. Matu? Yes, yes. Yeah, please. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for giving me the chance to speak out what's happening in Myanmar, especially Mandalay. Firstly, I would like to share screen. Dila, there's your screen. Yes. Let's uh, see. Yep, your screen is starting. Yeah. All right. I, uh, today, I would like to talk about the ground situations of Mandalay after the military coup and the participation of Yan women in this uprisings. Uh, Mandalay, the second largest city in Myanmar, is one of the cities in which the military tenure have, have been carrying the most violent and brutal crackdowns. Uh, on fourth day, after the military, after the military announced that uh, they have seized the power, the youth from Mandalay have started the very first protest against the coup across the country. This protest was led by the Yan Majiga Tauta, and a group of 10 people were peacefully demonstrating. But as the first time, the police arrested four Yan men, a man then, and not releasing yet. With the purpose of beating the network of protest groups for demanding democracy and condemning the military coup, uh, on 11 February 2021, the Anti-Coup Forces Coordination Committee Mandalay was formed, uh, including student unions, men's religious organizations, civil servants, political parties, civil society organizations, and so on. Uh, here, I'm seeing these photos with the leading of that committee, the people from Mandalay have brought together at the peaceful sit in general strikes and the peaceful marches against the coup day by day. And here, uh, the energy of medical family and engineering family is also very powerful in Mandalay. They march with their own roots almost every day and mm -hmm. Most who perform civil disobedience movements are from dead families. Uh, the monks also participated in the protests. And then, though the people peacefully demonstrated either with their own way or the collective way, the soldiers and police used the rubber bullets and slingshots to disperse the pro protesters. And then, uh, hung by seeing this photo, this photo is each neighborhood community have performed the guard duties in turn at their respiratory wharves every night. Uh, this is because the troops have tried to destroy the houses of the people and capture the civil servants who do civil disobedience movement, especially at night. And uh, the brutal Bloody crackdowns have been happening later after the two weeks of the military coup. Why the CDM railway workers refused to drive the tray and prevented from it by seeing these photos? The soldiers and police used tear gas and fired the rubber, fired into a housing compound and shot the rubber bullets, and at least 10 people were injured uh, during that crisis. Another case was the bloodiest case happened in Mandalay. On 20 February, when the police officers planned to uh, depart the ship from the harbor, the staffs and people peacefully demonstrated to them. The police and expertly started to use water cannons, tear gas, and then shot with the rear bullets, rubber bullets to demonstrators and beat even to the medic volunteers. Uh, during that crisis, four people were dying in which one was just 17 years old and dying with a headshot, and at least 30 people were injured. It was the worst crackdown happened across the country during that time. 
Uh, so these people were injury during that crisis and this Yan Y was dying with a headshot during that crisis. Yes. Um, then, since the last week of February, the soldiers and police have carried out the violent crackdowns spreading over the towns to disperse the protesters. Even though the people are demonstrating peacefully in favor of human rights, the military brutally pressed down to the people, not only by using the real bullets, rubber bullets, tear gas, also destroying the pins people don't like, cars, cycles, uh, something like that. And on on 3rd March, a 19-year-old girl was shot in head who defended against the troops at the front line without any protection. During this week, the actions by the police are becoming worse than worse. So uh, by seeing these crises, uh, we can see the students and youth mostly and actively participate in and lead the protests while the policemen are suppressing the people with the gun shots brutally. Now we lost the 39 lives of our civilians in total. And I would, uh, I would also talk, would like to talk about the young woman in the protest. Uh, we can also see the young woman also fearlessly joined in the protest with the strongly support of their parents. Uh, we can see the women who participate in protests with their own ways. By seeing the case of Mandalay, why the Chinese young girl protested and defended against the police together with the men, she got headshot and lost her life. She is still very, very young and the only child for her parents. But we can see her braveness by seeing that she donated her body by riding down in the cat she wore. And so we can see the movements of women while starting the protest. In Yangon, the first protest was led by the Federation of General Workers, Myanmar, in which most Yan women workers have leading the protest and marching on the roads. And then uh, the organizations working for women's rights and gender equality announced that they will collaborate again at the time of restoring democratically elected government. And the women technical working groups also, uh, which have been working with the government bodies, declared that they will resign from these groups until the elected government restored back. And uh, we also see the women activists are also demonstrating their rights in front of the embassies almost every day and sending the open letters to them. And many young girls are being seen on the stage and delivering the speech against the coup. And most young women are participating in every such, such as defending in front line together with the young men joining the protest delivering speeches. And the parents, role, the role of the parents are also very supportive to them. Uh, that's why the young women involvements are increasing. Uh, to conclude, we are losing lives day by day and our hope. This is not about Myanmar's internet affairs. This is about our human rights, which is part of our entire human race. All human rights, including rights to live, rights to have human security, rights to have freedom, rights to live in a safe environment, right to be free from inhuman actions, rights to speak, rights to demonstrate are brutally violated. So the message I want to give in here is the word messy this. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, uh, Matu. It was an excellent presentation. And the, the pictures were very, very captures the spirit very, very clearly. Okay, we want to move on again. Uh, so the next speaker then is Hintuzo. Hintuzo and the next speaker after this as well, they are a bit older, about 10 years older than the earlier round of speakers. Uh, Hintuzo is his borrowed name. He's married with one daughter. He studies communication studies in Mandalay. He's a Muslim. So he's a Muslim and he will uh, share with us his observations about how the Muslims and Hindus have been participating, responding to developments. Uh, Hintuzo. Two.
Hentuzo, bukan ini. Hello na, Willet. Yeah, okay. Hello, hello. Uh, okay. Hi, 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 everyone. Sorry. Uh, this is time to you know hit the pots and metal. So, uh, a bit noisy, you know. Um, now it's eight. Yeah. Yeah, yeah already. Yeah, yeah. Eight o'clock in your place. Yeah, eight o'clock yeah. every night. Yeah. Yeah, eight, eight o'clock every night. Yeah. And uh, I'm Heng, and I'm from Manali, and I have been observing the change in different ethnic uh, and religious religious group as well as uh, religion uh, among them. Uh, so as you see in the picture, there are you know a diverse group of people in the crowd. So you might you might ask me, is this strange? So I will say yes because you know uh, there are you know. Uh, Starting, uh, there there are more or less uh, clash and intolerance among the these are uh, you know different uh, religious and ethnic groups, uh, particularly uh, between Muslim and Buddhist communities. Although there is a certain amount of population who believe in human rights, uh, equal citizenship, and religious freedom, there is a huge conservative uh, group of people in every group who have uh, more or less uh, aggressive manner on diversity. Um, as you know, uh, you know, in our country, uh, there are a lot of uh, different religious and ethnic groups in our country, uh, also in Mandalay. So, uh, particularly Indian descendants, uh, Chinese descendants, and Muslim community, Hindu community, and Chinese community, with other uh, minorities, minorities. So. Uh, Therefore, a uh, voice of those who believe in human rights and freedom is not very significant as they want to avoid disrepute and, you know, they want to uh, avoid disrepute uh, and, and aggressive response from a uh, conservative group. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there are debates between conservative and progressive people in each different group. For example, you know, uh, some uh, progressive Muslim people criticize and mock their religious leader uh, for their extreme religious teaching and discussion. And at the same time, uh, you know, conservative uh, Muslim people keep shutting down their mouth or, you know, follow that extreme idea because they don't want to argue with, uh, uh, they don't want to argue with uh, conservative groups. On the other hand, uh, there are similar programs in other religious groups. Uh, uh, how do you say? Uh, mostly uh, progressive groups uh, do not want to, you know, confront against conservative groups because they don't want to, you know, uh, they, they don't want to fight against uh, those people. However, this revolution has significantly provided the progressive groups uh, some opportunity to voice out their ideas. Uh, you know, uh, there, there, there are a lot of uh, diverse people in uh, protesting, uh, uh, protesting crowds in the streets. Um, we see a lot of, you know, different people from religious groups and they are fighting together against the military group and share their ideas and helping each other in the streets. So, these pictures are, uh, you know, uh, circulated on the social media and people started saying that, see, they are Muslim and they are Myanmar citizens. At the end of the day, they are Myanmar citizens and fight together with us. Regardless of their ethnicity and religion, they are just fighting for the country. And because they, people, uh, other people comment, then, oh, yes, that's true. We always said that Muslim people love their country and ready to sacrifice for country. And the other people say that, oh, they, they open their mosques and religious building to high protester uh, from the threat down. So some people comment that, oh, it is shame. Some Buddhist monastery reject the protest protester to protest from the police. Similarly, on the other hand, we oh, see there are Chinese young guys who are protesting in front of the Chinese embassy who say Chinese people do not have sense of belonging in this country. Uh, on the other hand, see Hindu people who mostly stay away from politics but now fighting with us. So, uh, how to say that uh, we uh, we have uh, some uh, positive uh, awareness among people. Okay, let's stop discriminating them 
after this revolution. So in the future, we will, you know, focus on equal citizenship and we will share together peace and uh, prosperity. Uh, these are, you know, ongoing trends on the social media. And some people say that, yes, uh, we had misunderstand on, you know, diversity and uh, Muslim people as well as uh, Chinese people, we are so sorry for that. From stop from now on, we will stop uh, any uh, we will stop uh, discrimination against them. So these are very uh, positive on the social media as well as on the ground. Um, at the same time, uh, in each group, uh, they started uh, you know uh, criticizing their religious leader because uh, the military uh, council invite religious leader and religious organization in mid-February and uh, explain how they are, you know, going to, uh, you know, uh, run the state. And then Muslim people uh, post on their social media that I am a Muslim, but these, you know, uh, Muslim organization do not represent me. At the same time, Hindu people, you know, and the people uh, also uh, post on their social media that I'm a Hindu, uh, Hindu leaders and Hindu Hindu religious organization who go and go to, go to meet uh, military regimes. They do not represent me. So this is you know quite unusual uh, because we hardly uh, criticize uh, our religious organization. Because we uh, we don't we don't want to uh, argue with uh, you know uh, extreme groups, but this is uh, such a development. Um, so uh, they are very positive front on social media, and so they are starting change starting change in society. So the way the people think and also their awareness. So therefore, uh, I think uh, this revolution has brought a stronger unity and solidarity among different groups of people, ever than people. Um, I'm not saying that, uh, you know, we have a unity and we already unite each other and we will never fight against each other in the future. Uh, and we, we won't have any religious and cultural attention in the future, I won't say. However, uh, I will say that we got a certain extent of unity among our citizens, regardless of our diversity. And um, so I think this is a big step for the future political developments towards democracy in Myanmar. Thank you. Sorry, this very noisy. I'm trying to, you know, over the noise. Yeah, thank you very much, Hinton Zor. But what you're saying sounds like Malaysia. We also have our tensions, but we also have our cooperation across ethnic religious groups and all that. You know, so it's not so different at the end of the day. Yes. Okay, the next uh, person I'd like to invite is KM. KM is 38 years old, a bit older. He's married with a son. He has spent time, a lot of time in jail, which disrupted his studies. But, you know, I like him very much. He's a very smart fella. He's from Rakhine State and he will share on how the ethnic minorities, especially the Rakhine people, are engaging or not engaging with the protest movement. Uh, there are some of the ethnic groups who have actually uh, joined the State Administrative Council, which was set up by the military. Uh, but I'll let um, KM tell us about that. KM, please. Thank you so much, Professor Francis, and uh, giving me an opportunity to share about our sad story that the difficult time we're facing. So my previous friends have already mentioned a lot about and cover a lot about the, uh, what is really happening uh, yeah, in the demonstrations and the strike against the coup. So I would like to talk about, especially on the ethnic politics uh, which has been impacted by the coup. So as everyone knows that the seizure, the seizure of power by the military on February 1st, 2021 under the provisions of the state of emergency of the 2008 constitutions. But it is a real coup because they arrested every opposition leaders. So this is not according to the constitutions. No matter how they say that, they repeatedly say that this is a, the state of emergency. So nobody accept that. So it triggers a lot of social and political repercussions, not only in the country as a whole, 
but also in most ethnic states. And particularly the pol politics of ethnic nationalities has been profoundly impacted by the coup. In fact, the coup further divided up the ethnic political parties, the ethnic armed forces, and the civil society organizations, including the women and the youth, in terms of social and political stance. And it seems that it's very united in terms of on the road, but there are some still divisions politically, social and political divisions among the, I think, ethnic groups and among the Burman ethnic as well. So first of all, I would like to touch on the ethnic based, uh, the state-based ethnic political parties have been mostly divided up into two categories. And the political parties, those that tended to stand with the military and its newly founded State Administration Council, SAC, and those that stand with the democratic forces. But it, doesn't not, it does not clearly mean that they support fully, they fully support for NLD. There are some reasons, some reasons why uh, some ethnic political parties are not, uh, some political parties are not, uh, uh, some ethnic political forces, including political parties and ethnic armed groups tend to stand with the military, the SAC, SAC, and why some do not want to stand with neither the military nor NLD. State-based, first of all, the state-based ethnic political parties have never experienced any power sharing, uh, any power devolutions and decentralizations. It's far from federalism in the time of NLD administration. Despite the fact that some of them won the elections in its own state. For example, the Arkan National Party, ANP, won in all three general elections in 2010, 2015, and 2020. And SNLD, SNLD, Shen's National League for Democracy, won considerable number of seats in Shan State, which was enough to take part in the state government. But the NLD never care about accommodating them, especially in the state government, especially in the power sharing arrangement. However, the ethnic political party this time, like ANP and MUP, Mon Unity Party, that accepted political positions in state administration council offered by the military right after the coup. Uh, although they face some infighting and revolts among the members in their party by those who do not support the idea of cooperation and coordinations with the SAC, state administration council. But those who in favor of SAC assume that they can do something for the good of their party itself and for the good of the people of the states they base and they represent it in terms of getting political positions, power, political power, plus some developments that they hope they can do under the military dictatorship and they have never gained under the NLD administration. On the contrary, those who do not in favor of state administration council generally think that they cannot do anything under military dictatorship since they experienced it in the past and they think that it will never be justifiable. But it does not mean that they support NLD on the other hand. Now the parties that accepted the state administration council positions have been facing more division inside the party and the people support in the constituency is increasingly going down. So it means that it is likely that they will not get voted by the people in the future election as before. Even the military has driven another round of election in two, like 2010. Mm -hmm. Similarly, ethnic armed organizations are in the same situation mentioned above. Signatories of nationwide ceasefire agreement are neither in favor of NLD nor the military. They will never accept a, uh, uh, the military rule, although they have never liked NLD policy towards both non barman ethnic nationalities and the peace process. Because they have witnessed that there was no progress in the peace process by the time of NLD was in power. And the non signatory group, I am silent on who it is that see only between military and the NLD. I think that, but there is some public assault on them and in their liberated area. So, but there are also some speculations that there will be 
another round of civil war happening soon between the military and the ethnic armed forces, especially in Rakhine state and North, uh, I mean, North Rand Chan state. There are some fighting happening now, even in Chan state, between the military and the RCS's Restoration Council of Chan state. By saying this, you can clearly see that the military is now using all the tactics and policy that NLD has never interested, was never interested in terms of, in the time of power so that they can manipulate ethnic politics and divide and conquer them as before. I would like to touch a little bit on the strike because as my uh, friends uh, before me have already covered about the, the, the strike, uh, in Yangon, there is actually three categories of, I mean, group uh, on strike. And uh, the group number one who fully support NLD and NLD sympathizers, and group number two, including youth and uh, every, uh, the, the people from uh, different backgrounds in every walk of life. And group number two, who, ne who neither support NLD nor the military. But this group just don't like and don't accept military dictatorship in any circumstances. And the third is the general people from different walks of life, like you know, the, the people from the CDM, civil servant, like my friend said, you know, and the, the medical doctors, engineers, and so forth. So, uh, but there is one thing that I would like to highlight the slogans that the different strike group on the road has been using is a little bit different because including uh, uh, the, the, uh, the CRPH and also General Strike Committee, they, their, their slogan is very clear because they said that uh, they demand for the, uh, what, the release of NLD leaders, including the Aung San Suu Kyi, and for the restoration of democracy and the the re-acceptance of 2020 elections result. But there are some group who do not accept that, but the, uh, who thinks that it's not very comprehensive and complete. complete. And this group thinks that it, it should be, uh, the, 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 the demand should be the complete abolitions of 2008 constitution and the eliminations of military dictatorship, the uh, establishment of federal democracy and for the release of all political prisoners. So there is difference that, but there is some concern. I think widespread concern, concern uh, in the that the NLD sympathizers and NLD Waney uh, MPs that uh, they think that uh, the uh, if the 2020 uh, the, sorry if the 2008 constitution is repealed, then the 2020 election result will be not valid for them to resume the status quo again. So, but it is not true because. The legitimacy come from the people, not from the 2008 constitution, because one of my friends already mentioned that. So uh, uh, without further ado, if I conclude that, and the, I would say it seems that the whole country and all ethnic nationalities, including Bahman, are now united to some extent, but not fully, mm. to fight against the coup. But there are still some divisions among the people and the, even between the ethnic nationalities in search of the ultimate solution to the crisis with very different political views and stance. There are three scenarios that, we, that can be thought of, but nobody knows for sure what will happen tomorrow. Number one, what will happen if the coup is successful? And number two, what will happen if the coup fails and the people movement is successful? Maybe NLD is in power again and so on. A peace process will resume again. Number three, what will happen if the negotiation is facilitated by a so-called third party, maybe international or domestic, to have a reconciliation between the NLD and the military? Uh, uh, resumes, uh, and then the, resume the status quo as before. And in all three, the, these three scenarios, how ethnic nationalities and religious minorities should be included in the reconciliation for the way forward to the federal democracy through peace negotiations in the future. It is true that the NLD and the military possess the big part of the cake, but if there is no consideration taken into account for the ethnic nationalities that have always been an essential part of the cake, as well as a religious minority, it will culminate, uh, culminate in vicious circle again and again. So meaning that military will uh, the arrest the NLD and then they will release those people again and they will be actually reconciled at some point and then Ethnic nationalities, similarly as before, religious minority will be again under the feet of the two elephants. 
So finally, it is super important that the process reconciliations, the process of reconciliations for the way forward should be all inclusive. Thank you so much for your attention. <laughs> wow, so much you squeezed into this you know, very short presentation. Thank you very much, uh, KM. Um, as you can see, I mean, I thought, you know, Malaysia has a huge problem, massive problem with, you know, ethno-religious problems and all that. But when I go to Myanmar, I discover that they are equally complex, if not more so, you know. And uh, so it's uh, this whole ethnic religious problems, you know, is actually not exclusive to any country. In fact, you know, these problems are very clearly uh, evident also in a place like America. Anyway, um, is Debbie still here? Nope, Debbie left. Debbie is left. Right yeah, now. he have another video, uh, I mean yeah. meeting. Yeah, so anyway, I think uh, if you all have not checked, if you go into chat, you'll discover that Debbie has been answering a lot of queries by different people as we were moving along. She actually spent a lot of time to answer all these people. And actually, she's an old hand, you know, compared to many of us. She's an old hand. She understands what is happening on the ground. I'm a neophyte. You know, I've been going in to do a lot of work and I'm beginning to understand. And I think the purpose of our evening this today was actually to share information. It is not to actually find solutions to propose what is the next step we ought to do. No, actually, it is actually to share information in the first instance. Uh, I'm somebody who has been going into Myanmar for the last almost 10 years. And yet when this coup happened, and because it was preceded by a year of absence because of COVID-19, I was actually very lost. I didn't actually know how to make sense of this. I had no friends of mine, uh, like these young people who presented, to help me understand what's happening. So I, and I, when I tried to you know, uh, surf the internet and all that, you come across things, but they're all in the Myanmar language, which is not very helpful at all. So this, for me, this is an occasion, an opportunity for us to actually share information. We've got some friends in Myanmar who are very keen to help us, and they feel that this is their job to inform the outside world about what's happening. And uh, this is an opportunity there to pull in people like Debbie to help to clarify things for us. Our hope is that actually this is only going to be the first uh, of a series. As long as the coup is going on, maybe we are obliged to actually carry out this kind of a sharing every six weeks, every two months. Uh, I have to clear this with my Aliran people, but actually that's the intention. Yeah. So this is the first uh, occasion uh, for a series of actually uh, discussions with everybody else. Now, um, uh, I, we, we actually want to finish because I promised all the speakers that we'll finish in an hour and a half today. And uh, can I just uh, maybe, are there any outstanding questions which need to be answered, Dila, in our chat? Yeah, actually, Paul asked a question for um, our young speaker to answer if they would like to. Yes. Um, what is his question? Let me go scrolling up. Um, okay. Uh, are the are the people on the street counting a lot on the international hub, and what is the relation with ethnic minorities in this protest? Though Debbie has uh, some sort of answer it, but maybe from the ground itself, the the speaker would like to answer some of. The question? Um, is there somebody who wants to answer? Um, Go on. Perhaps you want to uh, say something, Go on. Yeah. Sure, friends. Sure, friends. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I feel that the Yan protester, they do, in fact, count the intervention from the international institutions such as United Nations or United Nations Security Council. But uh, well, what I'm seeing is uh, they also change the discourse very quickly. 
So if they think that the international help or intervention is not coming, they will quickly adapt to it. I, I think so. So even today, they are saying that it doesn't matter the United Nations or United States can do help. We will fight till the very end. I, I keep seeing, see, seeing it. So even if they did count for, if they, even if they did count the intervention from the outside, I think they will be very quick in adapting to the changing circumstances. Yeah. That's important now. I think the, there are two, there are different dimensions of the problem uh, when we are discussing this issue. Because on the one hand, you're talking about, you know, I think Paul was asking, you know, will you lose a sense of confidence and enthusiasm if actually no outside help is forthcoming for you as you demonstrate? But I think actually, if you look at the document that ASEAN Asia, ASEAN Burma has prepared, you're saying that actually there are three very important things that the international community can play. Can you know can be uh, quite instrumental. The first actually is the sanctions, targeted sanctions that do not hurt the ordinary people. Targeted sanctions against the regime itself, particular generals, their cronies, and their companies, and so on and so forth. So that's very clear. You know, it's not something that the man in the street can do, but people like us, if we are in position, we should pressure our governments to be able to do something like this. Number two. Is actually then they feel that actually the national, uh, the Security Council should begin to send a delegation there, as they did over the whole Rohingya issue, you know, and the uh, and the, the the Myanmar regime was forced to actually listen and entertain because the whole world was watching, so they feel that actually that's also on the cards. So the first point is actually the sanctions. The second point is let's get a. Uh, Security Council delegation to go and visit this place. And if it's ongoing, the coup is still on, you know, you have the right to quickly intervene as soon as possible. And uh, uh, the, the general, senior general has not responded to this. And number three is actually the economic matters, the economy matters. And they're saying that actually, if you've got, um, investments ongoing, please reconsider. These are talking to a big business who are involved in investing in the country. Reconsider your investments. Uh, if you have uh, loans, maybe you should, it's time for you to recall these loans and uh, please do not begin to initiate new businesses, you know, until they have resolved this problem of the coup. You know, and the people have already, you know, actually boycotted. Uh, they are in dire straits already. Um, you know, it's not a, because a lot of the foreign investors, businessmen, international business, when they are, when they are told that there's something they ought to do, they always say that, oh, but it will hurt the people on the street. But the people on the street are telling us that, no, we want you to do that. We want to snuff out all kind of financial, you know, air that the, the Luthor is trying to take from you to maintain themselves. Is there anything else that the others want to add? Uh, Ted, um, no, Ko, um, Matu, KM, any last words from you all? Colwyn? Hello. I, I saw, sorry sir, can I say something? Yes, yes. I saw a comment that uh, the, the, if the military can be taken by the protester, it will be great act. But <laughs> it's really difficult for us uh, in reality because as uh, my friends before me mentioned that already, because they're unarmed and all the times, you know, the brutality and the, for example, like the violence that against the protester is now uh, going high. So now people are actually really, uh, uh, I mean, fatigued and they're tired of what a UN has been releasing statement of concern, concern all the time. So they demand that they a real, you know, support from international communities that we have never had. And then there are a lot, a lot of assumptions that the international community system will never come, <laughs> you know, apart from some aids and humanitarian aids, because uh, it is, I think, really difficult because now that you see the ASEAN role, because they only would like to reconcile between the two sides, NLD and the military, that's all. 
So they cannot do mass things. So we are not much expecting actually many things from international community as well. But uh, the people who protest in the real field are. Thank you. Yeah, yeah uh, Francis, Luwin want to say something as well. Yes. Him space. Luwin, yeah. go ahead. Go Luwin. Uh, yep. Hi, yeah. Um, I just want to say this. Uh, Myanmar has been a divided society for long, and the economy is also very much, uh, you know, developing economy, not very rich. This is being, like, you know, uh, uh, being modest uh, about the, the, this, the economy in Myanmar. Of course, like, uh, this movement uh, is being led by young people who, who, who were brought up in democratic, you know, semi-democratic era. They lived under the semi-democratic regime and yet they are very, you know, open-minded and uh, they are very unapologetic. Uh, I found one gay boy, you know, who might be around 17, who was saying like, uh, instead of this shit, give me a boyfriend. I mean, like, uh, uh, this is so much, uh, you know, uh, this was such a taboo for our generation, be for people to speak out like this, but they could, like, very unapologetically speak out. So, of course, yes, um, they are appealing to international community, they are apologizing to all the atrocities and brutalities the Myanmar military had to Rohingya people, but yeah, I I am I am very uh, encouraged by this. But at the same time, I I I see how how adamant and resistant the strong institutions like the military itself, the religion, the conservative nature of all these strong and undisrupted institutions. So so what we need to what we need to do is uh, for our young people not to lose hope and keep on the fight. I am. I don't think this will be over. This will be over soon. And still, the 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 like you know the disgusting elements of the society, disgusting values in the society are still there. And if the young people think they can easily dismantle them then that is kind of false hope. And I don't, I, I, I see that like, you know, in a lot of uh, our protesters and, you know, analysts as well, they're very much hopeful of the movement as much as I am, but we need to be very careful with that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Luin. Um, okay, um, maybe it's time for us to try to wrap up. Um, the first point I want to make is, uh, how will the crisis end? I think there are lessons, you know, if you look back at the 1988 uprising. Um, uh, we are early days yet because that one lasted for six, seven weeks. You know, and uh, unfortunately, that in that incident, there were 3,000 lives lost. And we have lost already about 50 plus people, you know, in this case. So there's, there's a... Um, but of course... The whole tension, the whole problem in 1988 was uh, there was also a power vacuum. Um, you know, Niwin had pulled out, and then the uh, you know the butcher took over for a while. General Somong took over. You know, uh, uh, Doctor Mom. Uh, you know, so there, there was a power vacuum, and among the people who were trying to take over power, there was a tension between you know a very very young you know, Aung San Suu Kyi and UNU who tried to claim power. So there was that kind of uncertainty. So I'm afraid that, you know, there are lessons to draw, but the lessons that one can draw from it are quite negative ones. I want to be a bit more positive. And I think the first point I want to make is that the youth, the Gen Z that has been so instrumental in opposing the coup, their proposals and interests must be accommodated in whatever reckoning that we want to make. They want a Myanmar that is democratic, developed, peaceful, they have made themselves heard, they want to participate. So whatever the solution, we need to take this into consideration. 
Number two, in the hidden history of Myanmar, of Burma, Tan Min Wu. Tan Min Wu is the grandson of Wu Tan, the second gen of the United Nations. He incorporates into his book a history of the relationship of the Burma Buddhist people, not only vis-a-vis -vis the British colonizers, but also its problematic relations with the ethnic minorities, including the Muslims, Hindus, and Christians. All are there for him to say. And that's how the history has to really shape. It has to be more inclusive. So at the end of the day, we, it's not just a battle between the Tatmadaw versus the NLF, uh, NLD, led by Aung San Suu Kyi. There's actually a lot of other third forces involved. And uh, this is part of the problem why we wanted to incorporate discussion about the Muslims and the Hindus, but also the ethnic minorities. Their interests have to be worked into this. As it's very obvious to us in the case of Malaysia, you know, you cannot resolve the given problem in Malaysia if you do not take into consideration the interests of Malays, Chinese, Sabahan, Sarawakians, and so on and so forth. All must be included. Number third point. Number third point is, uh, actually bear with me, but this is very important. This is actually the problem, this point that Tan Ming Wu is making is also, not only you have an ethnic problem, he's saying that, and he wrote this in the wake of the Rohingya crisis. And he's saying that actually, the problem is enormous, enormous. And we have not, you know, as outsiders, and especially he was very critical of the West. For many in the West, he said, Myanmar has been seen for decades almost exclusively as a Manichaean struggle between the democratic movement led by Aung San Suu Kyi and a faceless junta. We never tried to understand the depth and complexity that Myanmar was you know, facing. Inside the country, it's also there's also the same problem. The myth of Myanmar is a rich country gone wrong, a belief to return to a golden age. And if you just have a single, a simple shift to democratic government, it seems as though it's all that's necessary to then unlock the potential and restore the country to its rightful place. The tendency in both cases is to gloss over the effects of 20 years of sanctions imposed by a military regime, 30 years of self-isolation oh, by the West, 30 years of self-isolation, 50 years of authoritarian rule, 70 years of internal war, and more than 100 years of colonialism. You cannot gloss over that kind of a history. The impact of generations of virtually no public spending on health and education is everywhere to be seen. State institutions are brittle and in many parts of the country, non-existent. For some of us, for those of us who have been in and out of Vietnam, um, Myanmar, you discover that actually education system is lacking. If you go and visit their hospitals, you get a bit scared, you know, and uh, I'm not surprised that some of our friends here, you know, who were doctors, maybe they got scared and quickly switched to social science. Social science is less, you know, vicious. It is not just the peace process that's missing, cannot take off, the economy that needs to be fixed and repaired and to be given a jump start. There's not just the Rohingya crisis that the West was so very concerned about, there was there's the problem of migration, out migration, urbanization, climate change, you know. And there's this, you have to then consider this new generation. This new generation, which is having new ideas brought about by this new experience with the new media. The outside world is absolutely right to prioritize the Rohingya crisis. It's equally important to jettison once and for all. The Myanmar fairy tale, he says. And to appreciate that working in Myanmar means working with a near failed state and to redouble our efforts to boost the country's own abilities. Otherwise, the current crisis, and he's talking about the Rohingya crisis, he's saying that this will be just the first of many to come. His point is actually we are at crisis point and what manifested itself as the Rohingya crisis, you know, now is manifesting itself 
as a crisis of democratic transition. And tomorrow it could be something else, you know, and, uh, and it's, it's for us, the whole system needs fixing. So these are the last three points I want to make. The youth must be brought into the picture. Number two, very comprehensive understanding to bring in, to be more inclusive and actually a model to take the country forward, which is actually very comprehensive, not just fixing elections, not just fixing the economy, not just fixing you know, migration, everything else. It's a big, big picture. Okay, gentlemen, ladies, thank you very much for your attention today. Uh, we're very happy that uh, we had a good turnout today. Uh, we, like I said to you, we hope that we will be able to repeat this in about six weeks time, maybe two months time. Uh, but I have to get clearance from Aliran first. I don't see that they will object to this. And uh, by that time, uh, I would imagine that the coup will still be in process, in process.